Um, I, I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, and I have to say that yesterday's uh, program was outstanding. Uh, and it, it uh, actually makes me a little intimidated because I'm not the showman that, that, that was here uh, yesterday. But uh, I, I, I am happy to be able to talk about umami because it's one of my passions. Um, but I also would like to, to thank, so I have a chance right now, can do it publicly, uh, Mr. Ishii and the Ajinomoto Group because I have worked with Ajinomoto for 40 years. Uh, I've worked with many, many companies uh, all over the world and Ajinomoto is right at the top uh, and particularly because of its view of the importance of basic science and, and, and understanding what it is that they're selling and trying to find the best way to make it and to explain it. <clears throat> and finally, a special shout out to, to my longtime colleague uh, who uh, was a, a shrinking violet when I first knew her, but was up here yesterday and can hold her own with, with Andrew, and that's Kamiko Ninonia. So thank you, Kamiko. So. <clears throat> So uh, I, I'm an academic, and uh, as many of you know that read the newspaper at all, there's a great roiling of academics having to declare what it is that they might have conflicts about. So this is a statement that I, I have to put up uh, uh, at every, every speech I make. Um, changes a little bit, uh, but basically we are required to show where potential conflicts exist. Uh, and, and I think that's, that, that is important. <coughs> So I, I'm going to do a slight review of what went on yesterday. And, and so first of all, um, everybody said umami is the fifth basic case, as if, as if this was for sure. But what do you mean by that? So in the first part of my talk, I'm going to try to talk about that and, uh, and try to understand what we mean by what is a basic taste. Second, um, I, I have a picture here of Ali. Uh, and, and uh, I, I don't mean to criticize him at all, but uh, he, he made two, two quotes here. Uh, umami is not mysterious, and umami is unremarkable in every way. And his point, of course, was that there's umami in all sorts of foods all over the world, and I don't disagree with that at all. But he's absolutely wrong. <laughs> umami is mysterious, and umami is quite remarkable. And the second part of my talk will talk about some aspects of that. And, and one of them is this one. Now, uh, uh, Jordan, uh, I wasn't, wasn't here to, for me to talk to him, but talked about how uh, he quoted somebody else saying, Ajinomoto makes you smart. And we kind of laughed at that. It seemed like a silly thing. But I think that there may be something to that. I, I'm certainly not going to prove it or show you any data really to support it. But I think it's something that's worth going back to and thinking about because as I will suggest, there's something very strange about our biology in response to, to glutamate. Uh, and finally, Mark said, I'm not going to pretend I am a scientist. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the summary. This is what academics do. They tell you the result, what they're going to tell you. They give you the summary. Then they tell it to you. Then they give you a summary again. Hopefully, you might remember it and, 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 and for the test. So I'm going to talk about first is, is uh, umami the basic taste. Then I'm going to talk about four interesting aspects of umami uh, that make it maybe different than uh, many of the other tastes. The synergy, satiety, somatosensation, big word, chemisthesis is a similar word, touch is really what I'm talking about, and then uh, uh, specificity. So let's start. Uh, we, we had this yesterday that the flavor is made up of, in my definition, three chemical sensory uh, uh, stimuli, the, those that stimulate the taste system, the smell system, and the touch system. And in touch were there, the, the, the ones that we're most familiar with are things like hot peppers and things of that sort. Um, I'm not going to talk about smell at all, almost all about uh, taste, but I will mention something about touch. <clears throat> so if we, if we begin, I, I'm from an institute that studies the chemical senses, smell and taste mostly. And, and th these were always considered the minor senses, the senses that didn't matter much. What was really important was vision and hearing. But we argue, and, and, and I believe, that in terms of health, 
our chemical senses are the most important ones we have. Uh, and again, if you think of during human evolution, um, the most fraught thing, the, the most important thing we did, most important decision we made every day was whether to put something in our mouth and swallow it or to reject it. And that's a life and death question. And if you go out into the woods, and I, I don't recommend doing this, uh, it's, not, it's dangerous, and pick up any plants and put them in your mouth, they'll be bitter and they'll probably be, be poison. And so these, these were real, uh, the, the, the sensory systems are the most important ones for deciding what we're going to eat. Uh, and and um, also throughout evolution, obtaining enough calories and enough protein and enough sodium, those things w were highly, highly prominent. That, 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 was, that, that was what almost everybody had to worry about. Now, of course, now th th it's not so much the case. And around, uh, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, too much of many things. But it's important to remember that there's still people, parts of the world, where the issue of getting enough food is, is an issue and one that we have to, have to uh, take in mind. But in, in, in Western and, and developed uh, uh, cultures, um, we know that many diseases uh, and disorders are impacted by our diet. And these are a list of, of the common ones that we talk about a lot. And we, I believe that, that, that understanding the origins and the basis for our flavor preferences and how we can make better flavors to make foods that taste good but maybe are, are not so laden with some of the things that people worry about is an important aspect. And I, sh I show you this picture. It's one of my favorite ones. It's kind of an old uh, Washington Post talking about growing families. One other thing I'm going to tell you is I am actually going to use the pointer. Uh, nobody else uses it, uh, but scientists do, so I apologize. So I also apologize to people over here and over there because they can't see the pointer. Um, but I still am going to use it. <laughs> so here's a family. And uh, they're obviously obese. And um, the, 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 the obvious takeaway from this, which is true, is that there's a big genetic component to obesity. Um, but if you look down here, uh, that probably means that it's not totally genetic. Uh, it's unlikely that they, the dog is related to the rest of the family. So, so um, we, we think that there's, there's both genetic components, and those are the ones that everybody reading about in the newspaper these days, but there's important experiential components that are involved in our uh, growth and development. <clears throat> so let's start with the basic taste. What is a basic taste? Um, and uh, I've tried to, I, I've been working on this for the past year or so, trying to study what people have talked about as basic taste. And here's a sort of a distillation of all the, 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 the um, criteria. One is um, perceptual salience and uniqueness. Uh, and, and I'm going to get into that uh, uh, in just a moment. The second is functional and nutritional significance. That would be things, uh, what's, what are these tastes good for? And third, which is a much more recent issue, is something to do with how the biology actually works, the, the molecular nature of, of the receptors. So <laughs> here are the list uh, on top of the, the traditional four uh, with umami, uh, a, a recent entry. And then there's some recent candidates. And you may have seen, actually, within the past six months or so, a new newspaper article announcing that calcium was the sixth basic taste. Um, and the, the same claim has been made for starch. It's been made for fat. Uh, we had to talk about fat yesterday. I'm not going to say much about it, other than the, the, the taste of fat is, is very, very subtle, if at all. <laughs> no doubt that fat interacts with taste receptors, but, but the conscious taste of it is not, not clear. The same thing goes with calcium. Calcium salts are kind of bitter, uh, but they don't have a distinct taste. Uh, for humans, starch has no distinct taste, but interestingly, for rodents, it does. Uh, so, so starch is an interesting one. Um, uh, but at least for humans, it's not a, a, a basic taste. So let, let, let's look at the way that, that this was defined. And the first way of people de describing what the basic tastes were were, were through intro uh, introspection, thinking about it themselves in, in, as individuals or as cultures. And we look at the very, very beginning. And here's, here's not the very beginning, but one of the earliest writings. This is Aristotle. And he talks about sweet, salty, sour, bitter, the same four that we, that we all know. Plus, he has a few others, and those three others down there are 
actually touch. Uh, they're not taste. But he didn't know that because it's in the mouth, and, and he was not an anatomist. He was a philosopher. Uh, but even somebody who was a, 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 a medical person, Galen, had the same idea, that there's sweet, sour, salty, bitter, plus these other ones that are, again, not taste. We know anatomically they're not through the taste system. They're through a, a different sensory system. But yet they're in the mouth, and they, they contribute to our oral uh, uh, sensation. But we can go back even further into India. And here, this is from Raza, uh, the Indian taste words. Again, sweet, sour, sour, salty, bitter, and then some more pungent and astringent. But it's not just that. We, we can look at actually some, some, uh, some cultures which may even be totally independent of all these. And here, here's one from Borneo. And uh, a colleague, anthropologist of mine, this is with her PhD dissertation work. And what she found was they, too, came up with sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and perhaps umami. Um, uh, and the, uh, also some of the irritants. And another one in, in, uh, in Brunei Malay uh, had the similar list. But these two, interestingly, had as a fifth basic taste perhaps something else, which is, um, which is uh, <coughs> uh, umami. Now, the, the, the end of the 19th century, we got rid of the, the irritation or the, the, the touch part. And so the consensus was that there were four basic tastes, sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Um, there, but there are some scientific approaches to, to, to looking at this. And, and, and one of them is to use psychophysics. And psycho, what is psychophysics? Well, psychophysics is, is, is basically looking at the, the sensory perception of a physical stimulus. And one can develop very sophisticated techniques to do this. It's, 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 uh, uh, it, it's, it seems trivial, but it's not. And um, the, the, uh, the study of taste uh, has revealed that in, if we do psychophysical studies, and I'll show you one in just a moment, we can really show that, that the umami taste is different than the other four. And that's, that's, that's an important uh, demonstration. So th this is a, a, a complicated slide. And if, if I can find the pointer here, there it is. So <clears throat> we have a whole bunch of different compounds. These are, it doesn't matter what they are, but they're different taste compounds, individual compounds. And uh, we have a bitter taste out here, a sour taste here, a salty taste here, and a sweet taste here. And basically what's been found is that if you look at all the taste compounds, simple ones, complex ones, if you're sure they're taste, they all fit within, uh, within that that quadrangle there. Um, and I'm not telling you how that quadrangle is generated, but it, do, it doesn't matter. But uh, look what's out there, umami. And this study, which, which goes back a, a long time ago now, uh, has been replicated not only in humans, but in using animal tissue, using receptor tissue. Uh, umami is definitely different than the other four. And this is uh, the, the, the thing until the molecular receptors were identified that made me believe, uh, and I, I think others believe, that, that umami was a different taste, perhaps uh, a, a new basic taste. Um, so this, I think we can agree that sweet, bitter, salty, sour, and umami, although umami has some differences, as we'll see in a moment, are basic tastes. What about the other ones? And my answer is no, because they don't have the salience. Uh, they don't have the, the grip. Uh, the, um, uh, Aristotle didn't see them. Galen didn't see them. They weren't seen in India. They are important, no question about it, but they're different. They're not basic tastes. <clears throat> what about the functional and nutritional significance? Well, um, the, the idea that, that we, we talk about all the time is that these basic tastes are there to tell us something really important about our nutrition. So sweet tells you presence of calories, sugar. Bitter, uh, evidence of poison. Salty, sodium, absolute required nu nutrient. And most times through human evolution, it was hard to find. And, and so uh, we and many other species have the ability, particularly species that eat plants, to detect uh, salt. Sour has always been a little question to me, but something to do perhaps with unripe food and, and, and spoiled food. And then umami, and this was, this was Akita's uh, uh, 
brilliant idea that the umami taste, because it was uh, 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 an amino acid, would, was the protein detector. And so th this would fulfill then that, that, that uh, we, the carbohydrates come from sweet and the protein comes from umami. <coughs> uh, 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 Kamiko showed some slides of babies, uh, and these are different slides of babies, but this sort of illustrates the fact that responses to these tastes are innate, they're built in. Th these are newborn babies. Uh, this is a response to sweet. This is a response to uh, uh, um, sour. This is the response to, to bitter. Um, this response is to salt, and it's interesting. Newborns do not respond positively or negatively to salt, uh, but by, by four to six months, they do. So all of these tastes are really part of our biology, uh, very much unlike smells where we, learning is much, much more important. Um, I don't have a picture of baby uh, 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 responding to, uh, to glutamate, um, but I did for many years study uh, malnourished infants in Mexico, particularly looking at their response to, to glutamate and to other amino acids, to, because these are protein malnourished babies. And um, as uh, 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 Kamiko said yesterday, um, uh, very young infants can detect uh, MSG in, 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 a, in a liquid, and uh, they show positive facial res uh, responses to it. We showed that they, it made them drink more, but interestingly, it only made them drink more if it was within soup. So if, uh, I'm gonna contrast this with sugar. If you give baby sugar, it doesn't need anything else. Sugar is great, and they love it. If you give them pure uh, MSG, they hate it. But if you put it into a soup, they like it. And that's a big puzzle, why, why is that? And one thing you, we didn't taste here is pure MSG, uh, because it doesn't taste very good. Uh, so it's, there's something interesting about how it has to be with a food, and uh, I don't quite know what that means, but uh, it, it's, it's worth uh, contemplating. <coughs> uh, but what experimental evidence could we, could we uh, adduce that would show you that, that this is really what's going on, that, 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 uh, that, that, that the, 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 the sweet taste functions to detect calories? I mean, it sounds like a good argument, but how do we know? Um, and I don't even know what experiment one would do, but one of the interesting things that, that research at Monell has shown in, in the recent oh, 10 years is that cats and many, many other strict carnivores, that is many, many other animals that eat only meat, have lost their sweet taste receptor. They literally can't taste sweet. And when we first announced this, uh, and, and actually showed a molecular mechanism for it, we got all sorts of letters and calls and whatever from people saying, but my cat eats uh, ice cream, or my cat eats chocolate cake, um, which of course are all sweet, but they are also have other stimuli like fat and things of that sort. Uh, as far as we know, these animals can't detect sweet. And what's happened is that during evolution, when they became strict carnivores, uh, there was no longer any selective pressure to maintain the sweet receptor. And so it developed, by chance, random mutations that then entered into the genome. And interestingly, if we look at cats and then many other strict carnivores, they've all lost their sweet taste receptors, but they all did it separately. Uh, they did it, so they have different, different breaks in the receptor. Uh, and this really, I think, provides pretty strong evidence that, that there is a, a, a that the functional significance of sweet taste is to detect calories uh, in plants. Um, this is the opposite, and this is one I don't really understand, but I can't resist showing it, where uh, these guys, uh, obligate herbivores, uh, as you surely know, uh, have lost their umami receptor. Um, and does that mean that, that because they consume only a very small uh, range of plants, that, that this is no longer necessary, and w will we see this in other species? I don't know, but this could be a nice reverse uh, example. And then there's this one, which is one of my favorite biology things in, in the chemical senses of everything. So first you have to know that during evolution, um, when uh, reptiles split off from birds, and that's hundreds of millions of years ago, the, the proto-bird lost the sweet taste receptor gone. 
So all birds, every bird in the world, every species of bird, ha doesn't have what is the normal sweet receptor that we and, and, and uh, many other species have. And if you study chickens, which is what most of the birds have been studied, uh, chickens have no interest in sweet things. But this bird, you know, has to have an interest in sweet things because that's what it eats. And what the, the, this recent study showed was that the, the, the umami receptor in birds has been repurposed so that it now can detect sugars. Uh, a remarkable feat, hard to imagine even how it could happen. Uh, but presumably, evolution has allowed the, this, this group of birds to then begin to uh, extract another part of the, uh, 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 of the biome uh, and to make use of, of nectar from plants. Really, really remarkable genetic story. <clears throat> Now, uh, I'm not, I, I, I've been threatening, uh, people were threatening, I was going to talk a lot about receptors. I'm not, actually, because uh, it's kind of boring. But um, the, the, the third criteria that people have put out is this speci specificity of molecular receptors. And uh, it, it was a useless criteria until 2000. And it's a, absolutely remarkable that it took until less than 20 years ago before we were first identified any taste receptor. Uh, and now we, we know something about them. They're, they're, they're kind of listed up there in names. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to really talk about them at all. But I do want to emphasize this bottom thing I've underlined here. So once these receptors were identified, and we identified them th uh, through tongue tissue, um, and our own work was with mice. Uh, most people's work was with mice. But we quickly showed this that this was true in humans. These receptors were active in, in, in all vertebrates, as far as we know. Um, the molecular biologist says, well, I've got nothing better to do. I'm going to look at other parts of the body. And lo and behold, what we've found is that these receptors, the sweet receptors, are not just in the mouth. They're in the pancreas. They're in the gut. They're in sperm. And they're in the brain. Uh, bitter receptors. They're in the lungs. They're in the nose. So what are, these, what are these things doing there? Well, the sweet receptor is probably doing the same thing they're doing in our mouth, but it's not conscious. They're regulating and, 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 and uh, re uh, recording sugar intake, sugar balance in your, in your blood, all sorts of things like that. The bitter ones are really interesting because the ones in the nose, and that's well, some ones that my colleagues at, uh, uh, at Monella Tan have been working on, detect bacteria in the nose. And when they detect it, they start something to try to kill the bacteria. So they're there to protect. Uh, just like they are in the mouth. Uh, same thing in the lungs. Um, and there's also good evidence that umami receptors are found elsewhere in the body, particularly in, in the, the digestive tract. Uh, and for all of these, we, we know a little bit about why they're there, uh, but nowhere near uh, enough. And, and so the, the, the taste system has become much broader. Uh, it used to be focused right here, and now uh, it, it, it's everywhere. Uh, and this is something that you keep an eye on because it's gonna, there's going to be some big news about it. <clears throat> so now to my second part, uh, which is that uh, umami remains mysterious. Uh, it's a basic taste, but different. And I want to talk about synergy, which we've heard about before, uh, a little bit about satiety, one study there that we've done, uh, uh, something about touch, and then finally about the specificity, which is uh, very, very curious. OK, synergism, well, uh, I think we heard enough about this yesterday, so you know what that's about. It's MSG interacting with the ribonucleotides. IMP is the one I'm going to, to show. And so here's my kind of uh, little illustration. On, on the left is MSG. There's the seaweed. Uh, on the right is dried bonito, uh, a dried, dried uh, a fish, uh, which has IMP in it. Uh, the size of that circle supposedly is the intensity of the of the taste, and then you put them together, and you get this much bigger thing. And that's uh, 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 Kamiko illustrated that. But I'm, I'm actually going to show real data, because this is one of the most beautiful studies I think that has ever been done. It's been done by uh, Dr. Yamaguchi. Uh, she did this in, at, at Ajinomoto, and this is another example of how Ajinomoto themselves did research that's really fundamental and uh, extremely important. So I, I do have to use the pointer on this one for sure. I can find it there. There we go. So along here is the ratio, it says, of glutamate to IMP, inosinate. This is IMP. 
So here is 100% glutamate, and here is 100% IMP. So this is kind of this, forget this, this is confusing down here. So if we look at 100% glutamate, here's how much umami there is. Uh, and this is, this is the intensity of umami. Uh, it, obviously, low levels of glutamate have some umami intensity. If we look at 100% IMP, uh, this maybe is nothing. It may be that IMP has no taste whatsoever uh, and uh, serves only as, a, as an enhancer. But when you mix them at different ratios, so here would be 20% uh, glutamate and 80% IMP, you have this tremendous uh, enhancement of, of, of taste. And so, so these are real human data. Uh, and this, there, there's absolutely nothing like this in uh, the other senses that I'm aware of. So, uh, the chemical senses, there's, there's uh, some suggestion with sweeteners. Hey, this is uh, some molecular studies. I actually don't want to go through d describing this. But basically, again, if you look at the big curve, that shows the two together. The little curves are the, them independently. This is, this is a, 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 a cell-based assay system from cows' tongues. So uh, it crosses species. And here is the presumed mechanism, and this was uh, uh, shown yesterday uh, um, in another cartoon, and, and, uh, and I'm just showing it here, that the glutamate and the IMP interact with part of the, the, the major umami receptor uh, in ways that we still don't understand. But, but we know that, th that this happens, uh, and uh, we don't understand it, really how it happens exactly. Um, so as I said, this is almost unique uh, to taste. And the and, um, question that raises to me is, why? Wh wh what's the point of it? Um, you know, it could be just chance, but, but it's so strange and so unusual and so specific that I think that there must be more to it. And one, one thought is that it heightens the flavor of amino acids. It's really a way of a double dipping into the fact that this is a protein, uh, a protein source. Now let's move to satiety. And, um, so I, I'm just going through why we would might think that uh, umami might be particularly satiating. Uh, first of all, we, we know it's pretty well agreed that protein is the most satiating of, of micro, uh, macronutrients, carbohydrates and fats less so. And so a signal for protein might well be also a satiating signal. Uh, and so there's a bunch of papers. This is a typical academic. shows a bunch of titles of papers that impress you that we read the journals. Um, and most of them uh, that are published uh, find that if you feed adults uh, uh, soup or a meal with umami compared to the same meal without umami, uh, they are more satiated when they eat the, uh, eat, uh, consume the umami. And there's even a study that shows some brain changes, re very recent studies show some brain changes that are consistent with the idea that umami is satiating in adults. So we, we've actually worked with, with infants because uh, there's all sorts of good things about infants. There's difficulty working with them, but they don't talk much. Uh, they, uh, they, 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 uh, they don't charge money to, to be subjects. And, um, uh, but we're really constrained on what we, can, what we can do with them, of course. So my colleague, Julia Manella, is uh, my, my former student. And uh, as typical of all students, uh, the, w when they uh, even when they're students, they tell me more than I tell them, and certainly she, she has done that. So she's done most of this work, and w she, she's done a couple of studies. I'm going to just talk about one. It's a short-term feeding study, very similar to what I just described, that is feeding, in this case, a baby, either a, a formula or a formula that is high in, in umami. So uh, first of all, though, I want to re reinforce what was said yesterday about milk and human milk. And this is a different way of looking at it, but uh, all along the bottom of this, uh, s this slide are the amino acids in human milk, and the, the heights of these bars tell you how much of those amino acids. And one uh, of them clearly stands out. This is glutamate, uh, by far the, the, the highest uh, level of, of amino acids in human milk. Um, these are different parts of the world, doesn't ignore that completely. Uh, so, so human milk is rich in umami, and it's rich in umami in, in ways uh, that other species milk is not. So here's, here's a, a slide. We don't know a lot about this, but if we look at humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, so in the same 
group as us, all have high, very high level of umami in their milk. Other species, like uh, certainly cats and mice, cows would fit in the same place, have very low levels. Why? Come back to that later, but, uh, but uh, uh, bottom line is, of course, I don't know. But it, it, is, it is a very, very interesting observation. So uh, what, what Julie and I did is, is look at this infant formula. This is a, this is a, a hydrolyzed casein formula that infants uh, that can't uh, digest protein um, are fed. And it is very high in uh, glutamate as well as other free amino acids. Um, and uh, we looked, uh, we did a study where we, we, where we uh, confronted uh, babies that are about three months of age with three different meals on different days. One meal uh, was cow's milk formula, so that would be this one here. And this is how much uh, MSG is in cow's milk formula. Here is that, that uh, hydrolyzed casein, huge amount of, of uh, MSG in that. And here is the, 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 the cr crucial experiment. Same cow's milk formula, but added glutamate to it. And so we fed them uh, uh, these, these uh, foods, uh, and we just recorded, uh, totally double blind, the mothers did the feeding, um, we weren't there, recorded how much uh, of the formula they consumed it, uh, until they were full. Uh, and we have very strict definitions of what full means. So. And then we actually did a second meal, because if there was a difference in the first meal, and it was because they didn't like one of them, then perhaps they would take more of the second meal to, to compensate for the loss. So the data were very clear. So this is the amount, uh, the amount of, of formula the infants consume. Here's the cow's milk formula, and here are the two that are high in glutamate. Clear, clear difference, and it looks as if those uh, just adding glutamate to the cow's milk formula made the infants satiated. And, and if we look at the second feeding, there's no difference. That suggests that it wasn't because they didn't like the taste of the glutamate. Uh, and to, to me, this is really the best evidence that there is a satiating effect from glutamate in a, in, in a human organism um, that is not confounded by all sorts of things that adults uh, 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 would, would be confounded by. This is just one study, and many, many more need to be done. That's what scientists always say. So um, uh, we measured activity. The difference is not secondary to activity. And um, uh, there are no differences uh, uh, in pr parental perceptions. Parents didn't notice anything. So very clear, uh, I think, result, but one that needs uh, a lot more uh, study and, and, and the second study actually uh, was a long-term feeding study, and I don't have time to talk about it, uh, but basically demonstrated that those infants fed these high umami uh, formulas grew at a rate that was identical to the, the rate that breastfed babies grow, whereas those that fed cow's milk grow, grow bigger faster. Uh, again, suggesting, but not proving, that long-term um, feeding uh, uh, with umami, which is the natural way, since it's in breast milk, is perhaps uh, sa more satiating and leads to more uh, uh, lower growth, which has been associated with uh, less obesity in adulthood. Three or four steps there, uh, and we don't have them all covered by any means, but it's certainly worth, uh, worth thinking about. And, and uh, I, I know that people that manufacture uh, um, infant formulas are trying to mimic human milk as close as possible, but for a variety of reasons, as far as I know, they've never gone so far as to suggest putting MSG into a formula. You can imagine the, 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 the PR issues that might come there, but in point of fact, it, it actually might be uh, uh, desirable. And I have to say one other thing, to cover myself, we always encourage all the babies, mothers and babies we work with to breastfeed. Uh, and only those that have decided, uh, for whatever reason they're not going to, enter our studies where we're actually feeding them long term. Uh, and so we're, we're very, very careful not to encourage uh, uh, or discourage breastfeeding. <coughs> so um, uh, I want to go back to mouth, go to mouthfeel now. And um, 
th th this, th this, these are two symposia. Uh, they're actually uh, out on the, uh, on the display uh, here. Th these were, to me, very important. They were done uh, and, and, and uh, was discussed at some length yesterday, done uh, after World War II by the US Army, because they were very, very interested in how glutamate might make, be useful in making uh, uh, the, the military's uh, foods more palatable. Apparently, they were awful. Um, and uh, in these, in these there, there was not so much science, but much more sort of introspection, speculation, discussion about what, what was this strange taste. And, and I just pick out a few. Of course, I'm picking out to illustrate my point here. Um, but th there was much comment, at least as much comment, about the feel as there was about the taste. And this, this bottom one by Crocker, I think, is the, is, is the most extreme, where he says, it seems that glutamate is successful not because it adds taste, but because it adds feeling. And this is something that people have sort of neglected ever since. Uh, now, this is a, the same slide that Kamiko showed yesterday. Uh, we, we have similar tastes in, 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 in uh, data. Um, and, but what I take from this is a little bit different than what she did, which is that, that um, what this added glutamate did, it didn't make it tastier. It didn't add some taste that they couldn't describe. It made it mouth fuller. And that was the thing that, he, that, that, that this was, was identified with. So um, here's another study, again, by Yamaguchi. Uh, at Ajitomoto, brilliant study. And what she did is she took a soup and she added either 0.5% um, <coughs> MSG or 0.2% MSG. Now, nobody can see that very well. I'm going to just hone in on, on, on some, of the, some of the things that she showed. And wherever there's one of these things going this way, it means the MSG made uh, the, the, the thing better. Uh, and if you look, uh, it, it enhanced um, the whole taste, both of these about the same, uh, and that's important too. You don't need that much. It, it, it does, this does as well as, as uh, four times as much. But look at down here, the flavor characteristics. Continuity, that's not, that's not well defined, but it is, a, or it is a tactile feeling. Mouthfulness, impact, mildness, thickness. All of these things increased, uh, it, it, to some degree, more than the taste by adding the MSG. And uh, again, I, I think this suggests that, that taste, uh, that thickness is really important. Uh, and, and there's been a, a plethora of recent studies on MSG looking for uh, glutamate in, in, in other uh, sources. Uh, all of them talk about the taste. Almost none of them talk about uh, the tactile component. So. Uh, I would argue that, that this mouthfeel is at least as prominent and important as the, t the taste in, in, a, in a traditional sense. Uh, and as far as palatability goes, this is one of the things that leads to the, the, the persistence that Kamiko talked about yesterday. Uh, but we have no idea actually how this works. And one possibility is that glutamate interacts not only with the taste receptor, that is the umami receptor, but also with a touch receptor. And we know this from other things, that chemicals can stimulate touch. And, and so it, it might be that this is, this is a combined sensory attribute uh, and making it, again, sort of more complex than maybe some of the other uh, basic tastes. <clears throat> so I come back to that. Now the last one is specificity. I can see my time tightening down. So, but this, is all, this, to me, maybe is one of the most puzzling of all. So if we look at cross-species uh, studies, and I'm a comparative biologist, actually, um, what, what we know, uh, and this is uh, picturing my work in, in, in Mexico, but what we know is that the, the umami taste is essentially aimed at um, glutamate and maybe aspartate, um, those, those two amino acids, but particularly glutamate. That's by far the most potent. But if you look at these animals, that's not the case. That same receptor responds to many different amino acids. And if I were designing a, a, an organism to respond to, to, uh, to um, protein, 
I would want it to respond to many amino acids. And that's what happens with the mouse and with the cat. We don't know about other species, but my guess is that happens with lots and lots of species. Um, uh, so, um, no, this is just what I just got through saying. So, uh, we, we can look at this uh, a little bit. I just list a, a, couple, uh, a couple of lines here that this is the human, that is the mouse, uh, this, is, this is data from uh, molecular biology uh, looking at receptors. Uh, and interestingly enough, in addition to these amino acids, almost every other amino acid, if you add IMP or GMP in the mouse, shows a big synergy. So humans are really, really odd in the specificity at which this is, uh, the umami is, is aimed at. So why, why is it so specific? Well, I th I, I, there's a, uh, to me, a, a clue. And, and we go back to babies and milk. Uh, and um, this is a, a great quote that I found, that each species, the milk of each species has a characteristic free amino acid pattern, which is an indication of the relative importance of these compounds during postnatal development. Now, this is a great statement. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, this guy he doesn't have any evidence for it, but I, I like the statement. And, and uh, I think it is a, a, a possible uh, clue. You saw this slide before, again, em emphasizing the, the, the odd oddity of, hu of, of human milk. Uh, again, this slide. Um, and, and sort of, I put another uh, column here uh, showing the humans, the receptor specificity is for glutamate. Uh, for these two, we know it's, it's not specific to that. For these species, we have no idea how the receptor works. This would be an interesting, uh, interesting area of research to see whether there is this correlation maintained by milk size or, or, or the, the amount of, of, of umami in, in, in a species milk and the, the, the breadth of the receptor that detects umami. Uh, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, thing, thing to, to look at. Um, so, Right now, it's an open question. We don't know why this receptor is so focused on this amino acid. Uh, but I go back to the earlier statement about how maybe it makes you smart. Uh, and th th there's maybe something about humans that uh, th th the, the need for, for, for glutamate, perhaps as an energy source, uh, perhaps for other functions, particularly early in life, where it's massive amounts in human milk, may have some role in our humanity and making us what we are. So that's a big statement. Uh, luckily, what I can say is, but it's pure speculation. So, I summarize again. Um, umami is a basic taste, but different. Uh, it has a variety of things that make it different that are very, very interesting. Um, and I, I conclude by saying what uh, all scientists say, more research is needed. <laughs> Luckily, there are people in this room that can help with that. So umami, still mysterious. And uh, I, I conclude with, uh, with Professor Akita. Uh, uh, and uh, if you go back and read his papers, they, they were prescient uh, uh, at how close he was on target. Umami is a basic case. It fulfills all the criteria, uh, yet, yet it's different. It's special. It's more subtle, uh, and it has some very, very other interesting and important characteristics uh, that we still don't entirely understand. So thank you very much. Yeah.